to, to, to speak in a way that, that, that conveys what you want said. And I, and I pray, God, that you speak behind my, what I say in a way that's more powerful because you can get into people's hearts. And I pray you do that. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, we've been in a series. If it's your first week to come, we're almost done with the series, uh, but it's still a good week to come. We're going to talk about being holy. And what we've defined that as over the last several weeks, Peter defines it as, is being set apart. doesn't mean you have your whole life together. You may be a mess in a lot of different areas, but, but, but you've made a decision that you're going to walk towards God, and you've made a decision that when you fall down or when you stumble or when you get sideways, you're going to get back up and you're going to walk towards God. You have dedicated to Him. And we've challenged people over the last uh, four or five weeks now to, to, to be willing to take that step, to, to, to dedicate themselves to God and, and to be focused on Him and, and what He wants us to do. And today, I want to take one of, uh, of Peter's uh, uh, verses here, and I want to talk about how we can be more uh, bold for him, because that's what Peter's going to talk about, and how we won't be ashamed. And we'll get to a word that Peter uses there on shame. We won't be ashamed of Jesus. Now, uh, to kind of set the table for that, Jesus says in Luke, he's talking to his disciples. This is Jesus talking on the, the slide behind me. He says, whoever's ashamed of me and my words, I'm going to be ashamed of them when we all get to glory. And he's talking about heaven. And, and there's some debate, I guess. He could be just saying, you're going to be embarrassed one day. He could be saying that. But I think it's probably a little stronger than that. I think, he's, I think this has eternal consequences. When you make a decision to, to hide your faith because you're ashamed of him, you're ashamed that if you speak up for him, you're going to be small or look bad or, or be discarded. So you just keep it quiet. When you act that way, there's eternal consequences for that. And the Apostle Paul speaking about this same idea. He wrote about it uh, in, in 2 Timothy. It's the last letter Paul wrote. He's writing to Timothy. He tells Timothy, don't be ashamed. Same thing Jesus said. Don't be ashamed about the testimony, about Christ's words. He says, don't be ashamed of me. Paul's writing him. Paul said, I'm in prison because, I've, because Paul had followed Jesus. It had cost him a lot. And he's telling Timothy, don't be ashamed of that. Don't allow your fear of being excluded to keep you from doing this thing. He says, rather join me with, in suffering uh, for the cause of the gospel. And, and, and in some ways, there's an opposite thing there. Instead of being ashamed, uh, be willing to, to pay the cost. Be willing to, to suffer for this thing. And the suffering may be something pretty big or it may be something pretty small. You know, uh, uh, take, taking something very small... Uh, as a Christian, I've always found it hard to pray for, for anything like lengthy, to, to stay in the morning and just dedicate some time and pray. I'm embarrassed about that, but it's always been hard for me. My mind wanders and I chase all sorts of different things. And if I don't watch out, there can be seasons of my life where I get real lazy about it because it's, it's a challenge for me to do it. So I, I just, well, I don't want to work that hard. And, 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 and when I do that, in some regard, I'm, I'm being ashamed of, of what he said. I'm not trusting it. What's well, stupid? I'm not going to do it. I know you said it, but that doesn't work for me, Jesus, and, and, and I'm ashamed of, of following him. But Paul says, rather than do that, be willing to, to, to hurt a little. And again, me praying doesn't make me hurt, but it is a sacrifice. I have to dedicate time to it. I have to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. There's a lot of things like that. I mean, there's a lot of things like that where he tells you to do certain things, but that's really hard, or I don't have time for that, or I don't know if I can make, make space for that, Jesus. And, 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 and so you, you, you don't really trust him. You're afraid if you go all the way to what he's wanting, you won't be able to do all the things you want to do. And, and Paul says, be willing to, to do that, to jump into what he wants 100%. Now, I want to speak, if I can, just a little bit before, to set the stage about this word shame, because I think it's an important thing. Normally, when you think about the word shame, you think about somebody who's, who's excluded. Like there's a circle of people who are, who are right and cool and smart and important, and you're not in that circle. And, and there's a lot of pain about that. I mean, you, you'd give anything to be in the circle of the best people, but you're not in that circle, and you're outside of it, and you feel the weight of being outside of it. Uh, Brene Brown uh, said that the only people who don't experience that shame are people who lack the capacity for empathy or human connection. I mean, it's just natural. If you're human at all, if, if you're not a sociopath, you, you felt that at some time, that, 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 that weight. And it can come from anything. Uh, it, it can be the student who's eating all by themselves at school while all the other tables are full. It can be uh, the, the family get-together where you, you feel like you're you have certain ideas and visions and plans and nobody else in your family agrees with that. You're all by yourself and your convictions. It can be something at work 
where, where you walk into the, the different office, people kind of get quiet when you walk in. And you think they're talking about you, but you're not sure if they are. You just know they get quiet. And no one ever really owns up to it. And you always feel like you're not really in the group that knows. It can be something a little more significant than that. A person might struggle with some sort of addictive behavior. And, uh, and nobody else may even know it. But they struggle with it. And because they struggle with it, they feel less than. They feel weak. They, uh, 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 it gets hard to want to, uh, to be with people because you're, you're sure they can see it on you. It can be, uh, it's, it, to me it's an ironic thing what the human mind does, but it can, people who have gone through abuse sometimes can feel shame. They didn't do anything. Somebody did something to them, but because they were so weak and because they were so powerless and because they were so picked on, they carry that. And they, and they feel that shame like they never totally fit in wherever they go. That There's a defense mechanism. You, you just kind of put walls up. You can feel it when you're going through a divorce or when your family's kind of in a, in a, in a mess of some sort. And, and everybody knows about it. And your kids didn't turn out perfect. Or you, you don't have the perfect marriage. Or you don't have the perfect family. And you feel like people notice that and they're judging you because of it. And, and the shame, it can come from body image. You don't feel like your teeth are right or your eyes are right or your smile's right or your, your weight's right or whatever's right. And, and you feel like you stand out because you don't, you're not big enough or tall enough or pretty enough or whatever enough. And the weight of it keeps you separated. And Jesus says, and then Paul in this verse behind me, says that, that you might be tempted to be ashamed of him. That, that at some level you know to be a real Christian, a fire-breathing, red-hot full of the spirit Christian is going to make you different than some other people. And the fear of being out because of that keeps some people paralyzed. I mean, I can't control 100% uh, how my mistakes have went. I mean, my mistakes are what they are, and people who know about it know about it. I can't control 100% how much money I have. I might want to impress you with my money, but I have as much as I have. And while I could I can cheat on that a little bit with credit cards. Sooner or later, I have as much as I have. And if that embarrasses me, then it just has to embarrass me. Uh, but with this thing with Jesus, sometimes there can be a temptation to keep that quiet. Because, you know, we're saved by grace. He saves us by grace. We're not saved by our works. And so, so I'm not, not going to deny Jesus. I'm just going to really keep it under wraps. Because if I get too out front about this thing, it's going to be weird and people are going to judge me about that, and I'll be on the outside. And that pain of that, uh, for a lot of people, is intense. And so Peter, in today's passage, is going to encourage us not to be ashamed of Christ. And there's only about five verses I want to focus on here, uh, so it'll go, hopefully, relatively quick. Peter says, and this is the section we're looking at, First Peter chapter 4, Peter says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. So there's two or three things I want you to pick up from Peter's argument. First of all, the fiery ordeals that any of us go through are to test us. The reason why God allows us to go through hard stuff, whatever the hard stuff is, is to test us. Uh, the word fiery there could, could imply like a refiner's fire. You put the silver into it and the bad stuff burns off and it, it tests the silver, makes it better. And Peter's using that same kind of imagery here uh, about, about us and about Christ, uh, about our relationship with Christ. But one thing I should say as a disclaimer, though, what Peter's church was going through was much worse than what we go through. Uh, it's a pet peeve of mine when American Christians uh, pretend that they're persecuted. There are certainly some, some laws that I wish were different. There are certainly some, some cultural things that, that make me aggravated. But when you compare what we go through, we're still the freest country in the world. We're, 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 we still live in a great country. You, you can go pretty much wherever you want to go. You can do pretty much whatever you want to do. Yeah, there might be some people who are aggravated about Christian and Christian witnesses, but not, it's not illegal. And when you compare what we have to go through to China or Cuba or the Middle East or Southeast Asia, we're just not persecuted. It, it, used, to, uh, it used to aggravate me when, when I first became a Christian. And I didn't know my Bible that well, but I knew enough to know that, that, that the attitude some people had was wrong about this thing. We'd be sitting in somebody's, there was a, a family in Tennessee who had done very well financially, and they had this gigantic house. Uh, they let us stay. When they would go out of town, they would let Julie and I house sit. Their basement apartment they had in this house was 2,000 square feet. 
the basement apartment. The house was gigantic. It was just an enormous house. It had an arcade in the house, and they would have us watch it. And, and we're sitting there in the house, and we're, we're, we're visiting, and we're talking, and we're having a conversation. And one of them was talking about some law that had just passed, and they said, tell us, do you think we're in the end times? And we're in this awesome house, right? I mean, we all have, we all have cars to drive. We all have money in our pocket. Man, if this is the end times, it's not that bad, you know? So I need to say that, first of all, because I think sometimes Christians delve into that, and they do it as a way to make themselves a little more important than they are, and they do it as a way to have like a martyr complex, and that doesn't really help anybody. We have a lot of freedom. We are still in a golden age for the church. You can witness to anybody you want to, and, and you should be. It's not illegal. Who knows what the future holds, but right now, uh, we can't compare to what Peter's church was going through in terms of fiery ordeals. However... The same principles apply no matter how intense it is. The same principles apply no matter what. And so whatever fiery ordeal you're going through right now uh, is a test. And, and it could be something uh, about your work or it could be something about your family or it could be something about just life, the weight of life during the COVID era. But, but whatever it is, life, Jesus says in, in John 16, in this life you're going to have trouble. So whatever trouble you're going through, uh, it's a test, and, and, and you shouldn't think of it as being something strange. Because when you add Jesus to whatever else is going on in your life, it's going to make your life more complicated. And that shouldn't surprise you when that happens. Uh, when you orient your life around Christ, you're going to kind of be going against the current. Uh, I heard it compared a long time ago to being at a big sports event or a concert, one of those big stadiums, and there's a whole ramp full of people heading down, and you're in the middle of it, and you really need to go to the bathroom before you get to the car, and you realize the bathroom is 40 feet back that direction. So you turn up into the ramp, and you start facing all those people and try to snake your way through. And most people are kind of mad that you're going the wrong direction. They're bumping you a little bit as you go by. Sometimes you'll get knocked a little bit off your course. If you give up, you'll start going with them down the ramp. So you have to kind of keep fighting back if you want to get to where you're going. And it's like that, and it's not strange. I mean, you don't believe this life is all there is. So because you don't believe this life is all there is, you're going to prioritize different than everybody else. You're going you're gonna to think about things different than everybody else. You, you can't help but do that. And so when you do that, you're going to bounce into some people who are heading the other way. And don't be upset about that. And don't get defensive about it. And don't get a chip on your shoulder like you've got to get even or, or, take, or get defensive. or It's just how it is. Don't be surprised. Peter goes on. He says, but, but rejoice. I mean, it just kind of proves you're on the right track. I mean, if, if, if you're really making this decision that this life is not all there is, and I'm going to live for the next life more than for this one, then you should expect a little bit of resistance now and again. And again, the resistance that we get compared to Peter's church, it's night and day different. I mean, you still live in a great country. You still have all the freedom that you can imagine. But, but you're, don't be surprised when not everybody thinks you're awesome about all the things you believe. Don't be surprised when everybody wants to jump on your bandwagon, whatever your bandwagon is. He says, uh, whenever that happens, whenever you get knocked backwards, it gives you a chance to participate in what Christ went through. And you should see it that way. When I try to witness to somebody else or when I try to share my faith and it kind of puts me on the outside of the circle or I'm worried that it will, well, I mean, th the best possible conclusion of that, well, maybe I'll talk somebody into taking a step towards faith too. But even if it goes badly and I'm kind of on the outside of the circle, it's not the end of the world. And Jesus certainly knew what it was like to be on the outside. And Jesus knew what it was like to be rejected and, and, and whispered about. And so, and so I can identify with him. And, and it doesn't make me feel like I am Jesus, but I just, I just make this decision. Well, Lord, if you were willing to walk through places like that, if you were willing to leave the comfort of heaven for the, for the pain of earth, then let me be willing to go wherever I need to go to do the things that I'm supposed to do. And that's what, that's what, Peter's, that's what Peter's saying here. Um, he says the fiery trial and all that kind of reveals your faith. Um, Charles Colson, in one of his books a long time ago, uh, 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 Rats, The Body, his book The Body, he talked about 
Dunkirk and the, if you remember the Battle of Dunkirk, the, 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 it was one of the Battle of Dunkirk, they were trying to get, escape from Dunkirk and the, the English soldiers were all up against the, 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 the strait there between England and France and, and the Germans were closing in on every side and they put out a call to the people in England to come get the soldiers. If you've got a boat of any sort, go across the strait, get the soldiers, let's get them out of there before the Germans are able. And it, it was an amazing thing. All these boats came across. And the radio thing they kept, Colson says, the radio thing they kept calling back and forth to each other was, and if not, that was one of their codes they would toss back for each other, and if not. And they all knew what it meant because England in the 40s was a lot more biblically literate culture than America in 2021. But, but all the Englanders in 1940 knew what that meant. It refers to a Bible story, Daniel 3. And in Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there were three Hebrew slaves, and they were told to worship the idol of the king, and they wouldn't do it. And the king says, you either do it, worship the idol of the king, or I'm going to throw you into the fire. And they say to the king, the God we serve can save us from that kind of fire. And if not, even if not, we're still not going to worship your idol. And the guys from Dunkirk would say that, and if not, and they would recall that phrase, the God we serve can save us from Germany today. The God we serve can get these soldiers home. But even if he does not, we're going to do the right thing. I mean, the trial proves your faith. It, it proves what you believe. And so if you get bounced around a little bit, that's all right. I mean, let it be an opportunity to, for you to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, let me move on here. Peter then says, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. So if, if somebody takes a shot at you because you're a Christian, that's okay, Peter says. And the blessed part implies that God sees it and that God knows and that God's going to reward you for it. And I don't know how that will manifest and how that will come out, but, but if you're trying to do the right thing and you get knocked down, that's okay. God loves you. He's blessing you, and he's going to take care of you. On the other hand, Peter says, the next slide, if you suffer, however, it shouldn't be as someone doing a crime. He says murderer or thief or, or a criminal or as a meddler. And I think his point in this verse is to get to the word meddler. As far as we can tell from study of Greek literature, it's a word that Peter made up, this word meddler. It's not a, it's not a word in Greek. It's a word he just invented. And it doesn't necessarily, what, what literally it means is an elder of everybody's business, a busybody. It's like he made up a word. It's, it's, you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're a busybody. You're sticking your nose into everything else. So Peter's imagining that some Christians were getting persecuted, not because of Jesus, but because they were sticking their nose into people's business when they shouldn't. I think that could probably still happen today, right? I think that could probably happen. So Peter says, if you're going to get persecuted, make sure you're getting persecuted because of Jesus and not just because you're doing something wrong. Um, if you find that you get into arguments every time you get on social media, it's not because of Jesus, it's because you're obnoxious, right? I don't know, I don't know, who, needs, I don't know who needs to hear that today, but if, if, if you're the one, that's the reason. I had a, I had a f long time ago, I had a friend who was working construction, and, and he was trying to witness to the other co-workers, and he would talk to two or three of these guys for hours about the Bible on the clock, and his boss told him, you're going to get fired if you keep doing this. And he was yelling at him and a lot of bad language. And, and the, the guy came to me and said, well, you see, I'm getting persecuted for Jesus. It's not because of Jesus. <laughs> you're getting persecuted because you're lazy. Uh, well, I got a witness. Sure you do. Set up an appointment. Talk to that guy after work. But if you're taking his money to work, then you're on the clock, man. You, you can't just be talking. Any boss in the world would be mad about that. You're not getting persecuted because of Jesus there. You're getting persecuted because you're lazy. And sometimes Christians get persecuted not because of Jesus, but because they're lazy or obnoxious or a know-it-all or a busybody or a, or a meddler. And so Peter's advice here, make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. Make sure it's not just about proving yourself right. Make sure that you're not, you're not yanking people around and telling them that they don't do what you tell them to do. Make sure you're not just being a boss of people because Christians can do that real well. In fact, if you ask people who are not Christian about Christians, you'll hear stuff like that. Christians are all judgmental. Why do people say that? 
because Christians are often judgmental. Right? Why do they say Christians are all hypocrites? Because Christians are often hypocrites. So make sure if you're getting in trouble, you're not getting in trouble for that. Make sure if you're getting in trouble, you're getting in trouble because you love the person so much that you want them to have what you have. Make sure if you get in trouble, it's because you're trying to give them grace to know the God of heaven. Make sure if you get in trouble, it's, it's because you've got a heart for them. I know some Christians who will try to make friends with people outside the church, and if they decide that it won't work, like I can't get that person to come to Christ, they move on. Like I made a friend with, Joe makes a friend with John, and he tries to witness to John for two or three or four weeks or two or three or four months, and John doesn't respond, so Joe says, I'm moving on. What does the other guy take out of that? What does he make, what decisions does he start making about Christians then? You know, sometimes we get persecuted not because we're on the right side of things. We're just obnoxious. And our whole motive of this thing is, 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 is the value of the other person and how precious they are to God. I, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my, my grandma passed away, and it was, it was a tough, boy, it was a tough stretch. And she was sick for a long time, and... and uh, at the end of it, you've got to do something with all her stuff. And it was a real eye-opening thing to me. Uh, we spend our whole life accumulating things that our children are not going to want. Did, did, you, did you know that? <laughs> your whole life is spent accumulating things that your kids are going to fight over who else can have it, right? <laughs> it's, just a, it's an ugly truth, uh, and it's the circle of life. Your kids will also do the same thing to their kids, and it's just how we do. I don't know. It's just a strange thing. But, uh, but there's a whole house full of stuff, and nobody can take the whole house full of her stuff and put it in your house. Nobody's got that much house. So, so we don't know what to do with it, and, and so people pick out different things they want, you know, different things that really mean a lot, but a lot of the stuff we got to do something else with, and, and the family, we decided to have an auction, and they were going to auction it off. I don't know if you've ever done that with somebody that you loved, had an auction for their stuff, but it's a real painful process. It really, really is. And I know people respond to that different, and, and others may not be as, I'm not, I don't think of myself as especially sentimental, but I am sentimental enough that that bothered me. And it's one of those things, if you've ever been through it, because you may see something that to you is precious. I remember when my kids pulled themselves up for the first time against that table. That table is an heirloom. Or I remember uh, when, when, when that painting was hung there in Grandma's room. Or I remember whenever, you know, those, those are the plates that she cooked with. And, and, and they mean something to me, but they don't mean anything to anybody else. And so you'll see a whole box full of stuff that you think is priceless. And he'll say, who give me a dollar for this junk? Right? It's a, it's a painful thing. Because it's only worth what somebody will pay for it. It doesn't matter what you think it's worth. It's only worth what somebody will pay for it. Jesus paid everything for us. You have never locked eyes on anybody that the Son of God did not give everything for. It ought to be the most important part of your day, the people you bounce off of. And if you can inspire any of them to turn towards the Lord. And don't you be ashamed either of it. You know, when we feel like we're outside the circle, when we feel like we're less than, when we feel like we're weak, when we feel like we're vulnerable, when we feel like, uh, for any of you who have been abused or kicked around or treated badly, for anybody in here who has made some mistake and it's a public mistake and everybody knows about it and you have a hunch they're all whispering about it, Jesus gave everything for you. So when you try to decide how much you're worth, you don't let the knuckleheads decide who, how much you are. He's paid everything for you. So don't be ashamed of him, and don't be ashamed of what he's done. Instead, uh, Peter says, make this effort to put him first. Instead, he says, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. Just praise God that you bear that name. I'm going to have the band come back up. Um, if anybody out there today uh, feels distant from this God who loves you, this is the part of the service we give you to come and make that right. 
And you can come, and maybe you've never made a decision to be a Christian. This is the time to come up and say, I want to have that. I want to have that thing that we're talking about. I want to have that relationship with him. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but for whatever reason, you've been very passive about this thing. You've been kind of ashamed of it. You've kept it kind of quiet. Jesus says you kept it under a basket. You kept your light under a basket where nobody could see it. Um, well, then this is a time for that too. To first, maybe to come up and just pray for anybody that's on your heart or on your mind. Uh, but even as we're singing this last song here, to pray, God, put people on my heart who I can speak to. Put people 